Occasionally in the past, I've told the story of my first automobile. When I got my driver's license at 16, back in those days, everybody got their driver's license as soon as they could, and I certainly did. I wrote my 365 on my 16th birthday and then got my license later on uh, in the summer. But uh, when I got my license, my dad went and got a second vehicle so that I could ferry my mother around town because he was often away through the week. Uh, And of course, the benefit to me was that I also had the car to get myself to school, knew other things that I wanted to do. But that car, which was a green 1977 Plymouth Valare sedan, such as you see on the screen, not that it wasn't actually that car, but it looked exactly like that car. That thing had an indestructible engine. It was a 225 slant six. But the body was not so indestructible, and it had a lot of uh, proneness to rust. And uh, in fact, by the time I got rid of that car, I suspect any accident that would have happened wouldn't have resulted in bent steel, but in cracked Bondo. Every time a fender showed signs of rusting through, which was pretty often, uh, Dad would drag me outside, willing teenager that I was, you know, uh, and show me how to treat the rust hole and put the body filler in, sand it down and prime it and paint it. That's just one example of many things that my late father taught me that I appreciate more and more each day, and that is never be afraid to try to fix something. Uh, Just even a few weeks ago, I was uh, standing in the shower. Don't picture that, but I I was standing in the shower uh, and and couldn't get the valve to shut off. So Diana went downstairs. She happened to be home, thankfully. Diana went downstairs, shut off the water, and uh, I got out and dried off. And well, thanks to YouTube and uh, a trip to get a new mowing cartridge, I managed to fix that thing, and it didn't even cost anything except a little bit of time. But as handy as a person might be, one thing that we cannot fix completely is ourselves. Most of us have experienced some degree of wounding, whether emotional or physical or sexual or spiritual. Virtually all of us have some trauma from the past. It could have happened last week or last year. It could have happened when we were teens, when we were children. It could have happened before we were born. We have these wounds, and the pain is real. It can have a lasting impact if we don't deal with it appropriately. In this series, we've been looking at the epidemic in the church that is spiritual immaturity with the help of Terry Wardle's book, Outrageous Love, Transforming Power, We've learned that to be spiritually mature, you need to realize your identity, that is to know whose you are. You need to engage in intimacy with the Lord to make God our deepest desire. We need each other to know that we were made for community, and we need to have strong character to drop the mask. And today we're going to learn that to be spiritually mature, we need to give our brokenness to God. What a lot of people don't realize is that even Jesus experienced wounding. He had his own brokenness to deal with. Now you're thinking, Jesus was the Son of God. How could he have experienced wounding or brokenness? But think about this. While he was still in Mary's womb, he will have known the tension that initially existed between Joseph and Mary over the divine conception of their child. While he was but a small child, Jesus will have sensed the urgency of the flight into Egypt while King Herod was trying to chase him down and kill him. And as his earthly ministry was coming to a conclusion, Jesus will have felt the betrayal of Judas and indeed the abandonment of his disciples. How did Jesus deal with this? Well, the Bible only gives us the picture of how he dealt with the betrayal and abandonment, and it is instructive for us. In Luke 22, the gospel writer tells of Judas's agreement to betray Jesus. We see the Lord celebrate the Last Supper with his disciples, including Judas. We see Jesus predict the denial of Peter 
And then we come to Gethsemane. After Jesus finished celebrating the last Passover meal with his disciples, he went, as was his custom, across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane, a garden, an olive grove where he would go to pray. I've been to Gethsemane. I've been to the church. I've been to the little garden area that is set up for pilgrims to meditate on the Lord's passion. It is for us a place of serenity, a place to consider what Jesus did for us. From there, you can see across the Kidron Valley into the city of Jerusalem. You can see where the temple was and where Jesus knew he would meet his earthly demise. Jesus takes his disciples to Gethsemane with him, and he gives them a job to do. This is Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 46. Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away. Literally, that says he pulled away. It was as if the, to connote the emotion that was involved in this situation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'd like to get out of all this pain, but only if you have another plan. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him, a sign of heaven's willingness to stand by Jesus. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Now, I'm a doctor, but not of that, and, uh, but I've learned that that is called hematidrosis. Guess how many times I had to practice saying that. Hematidrosis, it's a phenomenon where under great emotional stress, tiny blood vessels rupture in the sweat glands, producing a mixture of sweat and blood. At last, he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. The disciples, I think at this point, were beginning to realize what was going to happen. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. In other words, he's saying, turn to the Father for your own healing rather than trying simply to sleep it off. Well, right after this, Jesus is betrayed by Judas. He is arrested and taken away, and he knew this was coming. He had just poured out his heart to the Father in such grief that his sweat had blood in it, a a sign of things to come. Unlike Jesus, we tend to deal with emotional difficulty rather poorly as human beings. Terry Wardle talks in his book about layers of emotional difficulty being like the layers of an onion. On the outside, there's your current life situation, whatever that might be. But just beneath that and what fuels that is a dysfunctional behavior, which may or may not be obvious. And then there's constant internal emotional upheaval, which is the reason for the dysfunctional behavior. The, in fact, the dysfunctional behavior tends to make the emotional upheaval even worse. And what lies beneath that is false belief, where we believe lies about ourselves that foster the dysfunctional behavior. And then at the painful core are the deep wounds, which we often ignore or cover up. Wardle tells the story of a man named Jason who arrived at his church on the invitation of a friend. Jason was a large man. He dressed like a woman and wanted to be called Janet. He chain smoked cigarettes and often drank to excess. He'd gotten into drugs and was arrested and became a homeless wanderer for a time. He was socially awkward. He struggled a lot, but the people who got close to him were amazed at how intelligent he was as a man in his 40s, despite the fact that he acted like a teenager most of the time. When someone did befriend him, he would latch on to that person as if that was the only person who could ever tend to his every need in the whole world. 
Jason shared his story, and it turned out that his mother had abandoned him and his seven younger siblings when they were very young, leaving them alone with an alcoholic father who beat him senseless for everything that ever went wrong in their home until, in his late teens, he was kicked out of his home. He wanted people to know that he is not a homosexual. He was afraid of men, afraid of any threat of anger. He cross-dressed in order to gain acceptance from women since his mother had never accepted him. When he was shown God's love and compassion as people began to minister to him through healing prayer, he started dressing normally. And as that painful core was dealt with, Jason started to function more healthily. The work that was done with Jason and has been done with countless others since then reflects how Jesus dealt with his pain at Gethsemane. First, he turned his eyes to the Father, not to his abusers. I mean, Jesus didn't lash out at Judas, right? Or at the disciples, he looked to God. Second, he told the Father everything that was bothering him. Like a good Jewish rabbi... Jesus understood and was a student of the Psalms. And he saw in the Psalms the whole breadth of all manner of human behavior and emotion and understood that we can share. Don't miss this. We can share any emotion we might feel with God. We don't have to hold anything back. We can pour our hearts out. But Jesus knew that It was unhealthy to hold back, and of course the Father already knew everything Jesus was feeling, just as he does everything we feel, so he could pour out his heart with grief and lament to the point that blood and sweat mixed together coming out of him. He was brutally honest with the Father. And third, as I alluded to, he grieved. He expressed his emotions upward instead of outward. Instead of pounding on Judas, instead of berating the disciples, Jesus cried out to the Father. And fourth, he heard God speak. We don't know what the words were, but we know that Jesus got up from his time of heart-wrenching prayer in Gethsemane and was ready for what would happen next, his betrayal. What this shows us, I think, is that there is healing for the emotionally broken. To be spiritually mature, you need to give your brokenness to God. But how do we do it? You need to understand that, as Wardle says, the seed of Christ has been planted in you. You can be like Jesus. Follow what he calls the law of fruit and root. That is, if the fruit is dysfunction, then the root is deep wounding. Now, the challenge we have these days is to understand what is dysfunction and what is not, because a lot of what the Bible would say is dysfunction today is actually considered normative behavior. So if we treat the Word of God as our rule of life and faith, we will better be able to distinguish between what is actually dysfunction and what is merely socially acceptable or unacceptable behavior. Ultimately, to be healed... We need to follow Jesus' steps in Gethsemane. Take your pain to the Father. Tell God exactly what happened. Grieve the loss. Listen for the whispers of God. Forgive the offenders, right? When Jesus got to the cross, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. And walk in victory. That is, lay claim to the hope that God gives. If you're somebody who tends to behave in a dysfunctional manner, understand that there is a deep wound within you that Jesus wants to heal. Commonly, we tend to try to fill this wound with something that will make us feel better, whether it's food or drugs or sex or booze or shopping or something. When in reality, only Jesus can heal our wound. Start by unearthing the wound and presenting it to God. This might be the hardest part of all. 
because our wounds are painful and we would rather, as a result of that, leave them buried. But to be healed, we can't just leave our wounds buried. We need to bring them to the surface and give them to the Lord. When you do that, tell the Lord exactly what happened. Recount the story that led to your wound, whether you say it out loud to yourself or to someone else, or write it in a journal. Tell the Lord precisely what happened. This can take some time, and that's okay. Unearthing the wound, remembering the details, time-consuming. And it will hurt. It'll hurt a lot. But tell God exactly what happened. As that story unfolds, let yourself grieve. Let the tears fall. Let the anger come out. Live in the moment of your helplessness. Sit with it until you've cried all the tears you need to cry. And then listen. Sit quietly. Listen for God to speak into your situation. You may not hear anything audible, but take time to let God speak into your heart. This too could take some time, but give it all the time it needs. As you hear from God, let go of your wound. Forgive the one or ones that caused your wound. Now this does not mean, hear me carefully, this does not mean that what was done wrong is no longer wrong. It's still wrong. It, doesn't all, it also doesn't mean that you have to spend time with this person or embrace them. It means that you have to let go of what has been the cause of this trauma and consign it to the care of God. Forgiving another person doesn't right the wrong. What it does is set you free from its power. And finally, accept that in the Lord Jesus Christ you have hope, you have a future, and walk in that victory over your wound. On the uh, lower knuckle of the index finger of my right hand, I have a small scar. I can see it here. I did a close-up for you to see it on the screen, but even there you might not be able to see it. It's hardly visible anymore, but I can still see it every time I look at it. I am reminded of what caused it. When I was first getting into model trains, uh, being a fairly thrifty fellow, I realized that the most cost-effective way to put the proper amount of weight in an HO scale freight car was to uh, use pennies uh, over the bolsters and glue them one on top of the other over the bolsters on either end of, the, of an enclosed freight car of some sort. And uh, so one night I was sitting in the TV room with Diana, who was watching television. This was before she was making flowers. Remember those days? Um, and... Uh, uh, I wasn't paying attention to my work at that particular moment, and my hand ended up underneath the nozzle of the hot glue gun, which if you know hot glue guns, they can tend to sometimes drop a little bit. And next thing I knew, I had a hand in a lot of pain, and I pulled back, and of course the first thing I wanted to do was get rid of the thing causing the pain, so I ran my hand across my other hand, and it took the glob of blue glue away, but it also took a fair chunk of skin away with it. It caused, of course, immediate pain. Today, I remember that event clearly, as you can tell. But there is no pain there anymore. There is only a memory, only a scar. God can do that with your wound, whether it's a physical wound, a spiritual wound, an emotional wound, a sexual wound. God can bring healing to it. If you will bring it to him in openness and honesty and let him heal it. Counseling can help, yes, but God alone heals. To be spiritually mature, give your brokenness to God. Are you acquainted with Kintsugi? It's not the name of the guy who runs the sushi restaurant up the street, at least I don't think it is. 
Kintsugi is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery. And it's considered an art because the material that's used to repair the piece is mixed with powdered silver or gold or platinum. And the result is a piece of art that is even more beautiful than the original. Jesus wants to take your wounding, your brokenness, and heal it in such a way that you will be more beautiful than you were before the wound. He will heal you and make you more precious than you were before that brokenness. Turn to the Lord. Be honest with him. Grieve your pain. Listen for the Lord to speak. Forgive the offending party and lay claim to the hope that is yours in Jesus Christ. Give your brokenness to God. Be healed and be spiritually mature. Amy Carmichael was an Irish missionary to India in the latter part of the 19th and earlier part of the 20th centuries. And she served the people of India with the good news of Jesus. And even after a fall left her largely bedridden for the last 20 years of her life, she still ministered to people through her writing. And among her writings is a poem entitled, Hast Thou No Scar? Listen to these words. Hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers, spent, leaned me against a tree to die, and rent by ravening beasts that compassed me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound? No scar. Yet, as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who hast no wound nor scar? Give God your wound. Let him heal you. Then tell the story of your healing through your scar to be spiritually mature. Give your brokenness to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you care for us in no less than your care for your only Son, who poured out his own brokenness before you and received your healing. Give each of us, we pray, the fortitude to be able to unearth our own wounds, present them to you, and allow you to bring healing and comfort. We pray for those who, despite your invitation, continue to cover up their wounds and pain with dysfunctional behavior. Free them of their false belief and emotional upheaval. Help them to do the difficult soul work of bringing their wounds and pain to you for grace and help in time of need. And enable us all to stand tall in the victory we have won in your healing and to rejoice in the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Brokenness is a difficult subject. If this raised something with you that you'd like to have a conversation about, hit me up on the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I will be glad to journey with you and prayerfully bring healing for your wounds.